Welcome to section 9.3a. All right, gentle people, what we're going to do is we're going to take a little stroll down memory lane. So back when you were doing gas laws in chapter 5, what you did is you got this equation right here. You said that the average kinetic energy equals 3 halves RT. So this harps back to the definition of temperature. Temperature is the measure of kinetic energy, and then there's the relationship there for you. Ke average is the average kinetic energy. R is our gas constant, and since we want it in joules, we're going to use 8.314 joules per Kelvin per mole, and T is in temperature in Kelvin. Now what I want to talk about is something called the molar heat capacity. The molar heat capacity is the amount of energy I need to raise one mole of something by one degree Kelvin. So let's go ahead and try to derive this from that equation you were given in chapter 5. So we start out with the equation, the kinetic energy equals 3 halves RT. Now remember, we are looking for a change in our kinetic energy. So the change in my kinetic energy is going to equal 3 halves, and R is a constant, so that's not changing. But temperature can change, so this is going to be delta T. Now, what I want to do is change it by 1 degree. So my delta T, or my change in temperature, is going to be just 1. And so this corresponds to 3 halves R on this side. So now what I want to do is I want to talk about the conditions of my process. Now, if I go ahead and do something under constant volume, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my ideal gas and I'm going to put it in a container that's rigid and so my volume is constant. So if my volume is constant, what that means is all my kinetic energy is transferred as translational energy. So the change in my energy under constant volume is just going to be 3 halves R. So this is the energy required to take one mole of a monoatomic ideal gas and raise its temperature by one degree Kelvin. And so this is our molar heat capacity. So molar heat capacity is abbreviated with a C and my conditions where I have constant volume. Now let's go ahead and look at this process under constant pressure. Now if I have constant pressure, what that means is is that my volume can change. And so if my volume can change, what that means is my energy is not only transitional, but it also means that some of my energy can be used to expand into the new volume. So now what I'm doing is I'm calculating the molar heat capacity under constant pressure. So what that means is I'm going to take the translational energy and also try to account the energy for my expansion. Now, the energy to expand, well, that's technically work. So instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to call this the energy to do work. So let's go ahead and try to put this together. So my translational energy, we just calculated that out. That's just going to be CV. Now, my energy to do work, well, that is going to be P times delta V. So if that's the case, PV equals nRT because we're dealing with a monoatomic ideal gas. And what I'm saying is that if I have a change in my volume because my pressure is constant, what I will have is a change in my temperature. So I know that my change in temperature is going to be 1, and I'm only dealing with 1 mole of an ideal gas, so P delta V equals R in this scenario. So I'm going to go ahead and substitute R into here. And so what I get is that the CP, or the molar heat capacity, under constant pressure equals CV plus R. Now we already determined that CV was equal to 3 halves R, and so if I add another R, well CP is going to be 5 halves R. 
So everything I derived on that whiteboard, you guys can see on your information sheet. So what we have here is CV and CP. These are both molar heat capacities under different conditions, constant volume, constant pressure. Now, what we're describing here is something for a monoatomic ideal gas. Now, a monoatomic ideal gas, you can think of as just one atom. Now, if you guys want an analogy, so let's say that I'm in a room and I want to get a tennis ball ricocheting around this room. What is the energy that I have to put to get that tennis ball to bounce off the walls of that room? That's what a molar heat capacity is kind of asking. Now, to work off that analogy, we can talk about things that are polyatomic. So something that is polyatomic is made out of more than one atom. So if I were to go back to my analogy, what I can do is take my tennis ball, attach a spring to it, and then attach another tennis ball on the other end. So that spring represents the bond. Now, if I want to try to get this to ricochet around the room, just like my single tennis ball, well, I'm going to have to use more energy to try to get that going. Now, if I need more energy, well, that means my molar heat capacity has to go up. And that's what you guys will see here. For polyatomic ideal gases, it is going to be greater than three halves R and five halves R for me doing this at constant volume and constant pressure. The last thing I wanna do is I wanna show you how to get this equation right here. So what I'm after is the change in energy. Now, if I wanna go ahead and do this under constant volume, what I would have to do is take a look at what is influencing the energy. Now, the only energy that I have under constant volume is the translational energy. And so that's going to be equal to the kinetic energy. And so remember, kinetic energy is three halves R delta T. Now this is per mole of a monoatomic ideal gas. So if I have more than one mole, I simply have to times this equation by the number of moles. Now what we did is we also calculated that three halves R corresponds to the molar heat capacity of an ideal gas. And so what I get is NCV delta T. And so this is going to be the change in internal energy for a monoatomic ideal gas. Now, what I want you guys to do is I want you guys to take a look at some derivation. You can find those derivations in section 9.3. So what I want you guys to do is practice. Start from this equation right here and see if you guys can derive this equation right there. And if you need help, look in section 9.3. But let's talk about the take home messages here. Now, what you guys should note is that delta E and delta H, these are state functions. So it doesn't matter if I do things under constant pressure or constant volume, they will have the same equation. So for internal energy, this is going to be NCV delta T for constant volume, but even though I'm not in under constant volume, the constant pressure has the same equation because again, constant pressure implies a path and delta E is path independent. It's a state function. The same can be said with delta H. After you guys calculate it out under constant pressure, you guys will see that delta H equals NCP delta T. But even if I'm not under constant pressure, I still use the same equation, NCP delta T. You guys can go ahead and take a look at how they calculate heats, and we've talked about work. So I'm gonna give you guys all these equations on the equation sheet. What I want you to know is when you're going to use each one of these equations and how you're gonna use these equations. Now we're gonna practice this in the next lecture. So get all your derivations out, figure out what these variables means, and then let's go ahead and practice this out.
I hope that made sense, Chem 1B, and remember to stay safe.